So what actually is fair use and how exactly does it work for your gaming channel? Fair use basically is a law that allows you to use copyrighted material in your videos, legally, if the way you use that copyrighted material meets a certain criteria. The problem is understanding exactly what fair use is and what that criteria is, is complicated at best and about as fun as headbunting a curb at worst. So in today's video, I've got a very special guest who's gonna simplify all of that legal jargon for us and help us understand what fair use is and what it isn't. So by the end of this video, you'll know how to legally use copyrighted material in your gaming videos without getting sued or just getting sued or, or really just getting sued. So. My name's Marcus Jones, let's get stuck into this video. Instead of diving headlong into the legal jargon, let's start with a real world example. YouTube in the mid 2010s was a wildly different landscape to the one it is today. It was the golden age of YouTube channels like Filthy Frank and iDubs and many others leading the way for user generated content. Trust me, if you were there as the Cake Trilogy got released one by one, then you are officially eligible for a veteran's discount. Anyway, back to the topic of this video. You may recall that one of the leading commentary channels at the time was H3H3 Productions. In 2016, H3H3 was sued by Matt Hoss, who claimed that the video they had made about his Bold Guy series was an infringement of copyright. The Big, The Bold and The Beautiful was the title of Ethan and Hiller's commentary video and Matt Hoss appreciated it about as much as you or I would appreciate a hand-powered chainsaw. Matt insisted that he be compensated for damages. Now obviously no one denied that Ethan or Hiller had featured content from Matt's video series in their commentary video. However, Ethan and Hiller firmly believed that their video was considered fair use. In fact, they were so adamant that they were right and that succumbing to Matt's demands would set a bad precedent that they decided to take the matter to court. And he says, Remove it, never talk about me again or this situation and pay me $4,000. We could pay you $4,000, but like, what's the precedent that like anytime we make fun of someone, they could just write us a note from a lawyer and demand $4,000. And we're like, this is horrible. This is a bad precedent. This lawyer is going to run amok, not just with us, but anyone on YouTube. He can hit up Leafy and be like, oh, I saw you made a video about Joey Sal. It's perfect. I'm going to message Joey Sal and be like, hey, I got H3 to pay up. So I'm going to get Leafy to pay $10,000 easy. So Ethan and Hiller took the matter to court, claiming that their video was fair use. But before we reveal how the story ended and why it ended that way, let's pause the story for a moment and explain exactly what fair use is in in the first place. Fair use is basically a doctrine, a copyright doctrine that allows you to use copyrighted material without permission. This is Anita Sharma of Sharma Law, with 20 years experience in the field representing over 45 influencers, including FaZe Clan's Neo Rooch. She knows her stuff. So there is very sort of limited categories that you can use someone else's copyrighted material without permission, and that's, you know, parody, comment, criticism, reporting, or educational purposes, right? So for example, if you're a reporter and you're reporting something on the news and you're playing some song or, you know, to make a point or give an example, like you don't need permission there because, you know, the overall, the sort of basis of fair use is that you want people to get information, you want people to be educated, you don't want it to make, you don't want to make it impossible to get information out there and to, you know, educate people or, to be able to comment or criticize something, like you should be able to do that. Now, Ethan and Hiller did eventually win that lawsuit a year and a half later, in which the judge stated that their use of the clips from the Hoss video constitutes fair use as a matter of law. But what can we learn from this? So let's look at the video that Ethan and Hiller got sued over and put it up against the four factors a court will use to determine whether or not the use of a copyrighted material is fair use. First, what is the purpose of the video using the copyrighted work? Is it a commentary? Is it a parody? Or is it a criticism? Also, is it transformative? in any way. So H3's video is clearly a commentary video, so that's a big check in this box, saying it's more likely the court will rule in H3's favor. The other thing we mentioned is the big word transformative, which may sound a bit confusing, but basically the legal jargon just boils down to, does your video offer a different experience of the original copyrighted content featured in your video? So in H3's case, Ethan and Hiller would have had to have watched the video, they would have had to have written down jokes and scripted their own commentary video, they would have had to have filmed themselves and edited them themselves, and basically all of that has completely transformed the original copyrighted work. So all of those changes to Matt Hoss's original video, all that extra stuff that Ethan and Hiller did meant that H3's video completely transformed the original video and gave viewers a different experience of that copyrighted content. And so that is a big check, again, in Ethan and Hill's favor, saying that yes, 
their video does meet the fair use criteria. The second major factor you need to consider is what is the nature of the copyrighted work? So this centers more around the actual copyrighted material being used. So for example, a court will look at whether or not the copyrighted material you're using in your video is informational or entertaining in nature. And a judge will be more likely to rule that the video incorporating the copyrighted material is fair use if the material that you're using and that you've copied is from a factual work, such as a biography of Benjamin Franklin, which is factual. It revolves around things that objectively happened, regardless of whether the biography existed or not, than a fictional work, such as Harry Potter, which for example is clearly brought into existence by one person who deserves all of that credit. And so when it comes to fair use, if you end up in court over a fair use dispute, you'll be on more solid legal footing if the copyrighted material you used in your video is factual, meaning it revolves around like objective truths or stats or whatever, rather than fictional. Another thing is that you will have a stronger case that your video is fair use when you use copyrighted works that are published rather than unpublished, because the author of a copyrighted work has the right to control the first public appearance of their work. Now, since Matt Hoss's Bold Guy series are public on his channel, Ethan and Hiller do meet this criteria, another green check for them. The third factor to consider is how much of the copyrighted material did you use in your video? So in H3's case, the entire video was about 14 minutes, whereas they only used three minutes of Matt Hoss's content and copyrighted material within that 14 minute video. So now there is no set in stone ratio as to how much is too much. This is more for a court to determine on a case by case basis. But think about it like this, Ethan and Hiller are definitely more prominently featured than Matt Hoss in their video. So if Ethan and Hiller had simply just played Matt Hoss's video and then just added in some commentary or stuff over the top of the video, then they would have been in a slightly different scenario, right? So that's where reaction channels sometimes fall into a bit of a, a gray, uncomfortable area. However, people who clicked on the H3 video featuring Matt Hoss were more interested in Ethan and Hiller than actually watching Matt Hoss's video itself. So another big green check mark for Ethan and Hiller. And finally, the last factor you wanna consider is the effect of your use of that copyrighted material on the potential market. So does the way that you've used the copyrighted material, so in the case of H3's video, the amount of Matt Hoss clips they used in their video weren't enough in order for viewers to get a completely full picture of Matt Hoss's video. And so if people actually wanted to watch the Bald Guy series, they still needed to go and check out Hoss's channel. And so the court might interpret this in a sense that it doesn't have a huge effect on the original potential market because if people want to watch the Bald Guy series, they still have to go to Matt Hoss's channel and watch his videos. So what do we actually learn from all of this? Well, despite the fact that creators actually getting sued in this present time is relatively a rare thing, if you want to steer clear of all potential copyright issues, then you should, one, make sure that your viewers get an entirely different experience of the copyrighted material you're using in your video from your video. So if you're using copyrighted material, you need to put your own entirely original spin on it. So your video shouldn't feel like a repost of the original piece of content, plus you know the odd bit of lazy commentary here and there. Rather, your video should be able to stand on its own two feet as its own piece of content. So if your video is you, featuring a little bit of copyrighted content, that's fine. But if your video is copyrighted content featuring a little bit of you, then that's generally a lot less fine. Secondly, you should try and always use already published work. So generally, if it hasn't been released by the creators, the initial owners of that copyrighted work, then avoid it like an EA game with microtransactions. So this means that technically things like reporting on game leaks is usually a big no-no. At this current time, I don't know of any creators who have been sued for leaking something. And yes, those game leaks videos might get a lot of views, but you have to ask yourself, is it worth the risk? Because from a purely legal standpoint, the answer is probably no. Thirdly, make sure to use the least amount of copyrighted work as possible. Anita says it herself here. The shorter the better, like it will help you because then you're not um, taking advantage of, of using somebody's copyrighted material and benefiting from that. I would advise a client to play it safe and use the least amount of, of, as possible of the game when you're commenting on it. Again, it's not clear as to how much copyright material is too much, but the general rule of thumb is the little of the better. Also, you should be pretty good as long as you follow the fourth point, which is to make sure your video does not affect the original piece of copyrighted material's worth or market, right? So you need to ask yourself, does featuring this copyrighted material in my video 
make people not want to buy or interact with the original piece of work. So if your viewers watch your video and think, hey, thanks to this video, I don't need to buy the original copyrighted work for myself, then that's gonna leave you on less sound footing from a legal standpoint. Now, if you're a gaming YouTuber, this last point might be sounding some alarm bells for you. Because when you think about it, as gaming YouTubers, we make videos on video games, which are literally copyrighted works in and of themselves. And so let's address that elephant in the room. Are we risking multiple copyright infringements if we're using a company's game without their direct explicit permission? Do we have to pay these companies? How does that all work? So gaming is, is interesting because every game publisher, most if not all, provide a license because they recognize that it's hugely beneficial for them to have their games played online. Right, and that's like just a huge marketing push and bonus for them, and they want that. So they grant licenses to gamers. So unfortunately, you have to read these, and sometimes it's not the most interesting read in the world, but I would highly recommend that you look at the terms and conditions of any game, and they it'll th that license will outline how you can use that game. And that's what they've done to make it easier. Um, and some games will say, you know, you can play you can play online, but it has to be non-commercial. I mean, obviously you can't sell any merch with our, you know, games IP in it, the t-shirts, hoodies, et cetera. Like, so they'll, they'll outline the parameters in which you can play, but most, if not all game publishers have that license, which is how gamers can stream online. Companies recognize the power that gaming video creators and streamers have in terms of reaching out to an audience. So generally they allow for videos of pretty much any type to be created for their copyrighted game because it's just free marketing and promotion for them. I don't think I need to tell you how big a part content creators have played in the rise of popularity of games like Fall Guys or Among Us in the past years. So it's no wonder that pretty much any video game company would never say no to anything that's basically free advertising. Now with all that being said, you should definitely do some reading for yourself to double check if you're you're allowed to feature the game you want to make videos of on your gaming channel, but the good news is that most video game companies recognize that not all of us are 300 IQ lawyers who can speed read their 11 zillion word licensing agreements. So I found that a lot of gaming publishers have made it easy where they'll actually have a section that says, can I stream your, my game, you know, your game online? Or it'll say like, how can I use your game online? Or can I play? Or so they've made it pretty simple to find within like a long, you know, list of terms and conditions. And so you're gonna you're gonna look for a usage license or where they explain how you can use it online. Um, they they have made it fairly clear and easy to find because they do want people to be able to find it and you know to use their games. Uh, the way that they want them used online or not used. So it is fairly easy to find these days, wherever you're gonna download the game from. I mean, nobody's using you know DVDs or anything like that anymore. So wherever you're getting the game from online, there will be very clear terms and conditions of use. It's, it's not hard to find. Now a common question a lot of people have after hearing this is, well, Marcus, if I just credit the people who made the copyrighted work, like if I don't claim to own the work, is that considered fair use? Not according to Anita. I know, and just because you credit somebody doesn't make it okay either. Right. Crediting is good, you know, you should give credit to the owner. Credit doesn't equal permission, so you just, I, I hear it every single day almost, where like a, a client is like, well, this is for use, and I'm like, but it's not, right? So, especially if you're benefiting commercially, I mean, that's a huge red flag. If you're using somebody else's copyrighted material and you're benefiting commercially, that's a problem. And like the example I gave you before, where if you're playing somebody else's music in the background, um, as you're making thousands of dollars streaming on Twitch, like that's a problem. Now we've done our best to cover the main facets of fair use in this video, but obviously there are many. It is a big and sometimes complicated topic. So if you have a specific situation or question, it might be a good idea to do some research yourself, or in Anita's professional opinion, it might even be worthwhile consulting a lawyer. I would say if you're really concerned about it, talk to a lawyer. A lawyer will help you and they'll tell you whether they think it's fair use or not. Um, again, there's attorneys out there that only do that. They do fair use all day, every day. But, you know, talk to an attorney who knows copyright law and who can advise you. I can look at something and tell you just through experience, 
in a minute whether I think it's for use or not. If you're interested, you can find Sharma Law's website linked below. And by the way, this isn't a sponsored video in any way. It's just Anita's a bit of badass, so why not give her a plug? So there you have it, some fair use pointers that could help save your future videos from getting copyrighted. And while we're on the topic of avoiding copyright strikes, you might be interested in where you can find copyright free music, overlays and more to spice up your gaming videos. So if you're interested, I've made a video exactly on this very topic. I'll link it on screen. Go check it out so you can have fun not getting sued. Okay, bye.